Get the Arts, Parks, Health and Humanities uh, Committee started. Um, we will be joined by Councilmember Labonge <coughs> in about 10 minutes, and Councilmember Reyes has a, uh, has a conflict and cannot attend. <coughs> uh, items 1 through 4 are consent items, um, but we will hold those until Mr. Labonge comes. So we can move forward with item number five. Item number five, motion Alarcon Garcetti relative to the number of ebooks available, the average wait period to download a book, a plan to add additional ebooks to the library, mm -hmm. and the ability to allow people to apply for and renew a library card online on the website of Los Angeles Public Library. Yeah, this is something that I, I wasn't completely aware of, uh, but uh, it has tremendous potential uh, for. Uh, for using uh, the ebook opportunities to expand the use of our libraries, and Absolutely. and so it's it's obviously a good thing. But what is the uh, tell tell us about sure. this whole new technology? Yeah. Good afternoon, council councilman. My name is Steve Newcomer. I don't I don't think is the mic. On? On. Speak into the mic if you could, please. Hello, hello. Yep, it's working. Okay. It is? Okay. My name is Steve Newcomer. I'm the Director of Information Technologies and Collections at the Los Angeles Public Library. And with me today is... I'm Peggy Murphy. I'm the Interim Manager of Collection Services. Uh, the Los Angeles Public Library has uh, offered e-books since 1998. And at that time, e-books were primarily non-fiction titles and were used predominantly to check factual information they were strictly for use on a library computer terminal or uh, your computer at home. And then about 2005 was the, down, was the advent of downloadable media. And of course, this proved very popular with our patrons. And um, we provided a link on our website so that people can download uh, both e-audiobooks, music, videos, and in the last few years, actual e-books. And the ebook revolution really took off when uh, devices such as Kindles and Nooks and iPads began proliferating a few years ago. The library quickly became uh, the place to turn for not only checking out print materials, but uh, e content as well. Okay. The library now has in excess of 40,000 ebook and e audio titles. We also provide in excess of 500,000 downloadable song titles, a couple of thousand downloadable videos, and hundreds of podcasts. In addition to this commercial e-content, the library provides tens, tens of thousands of e-books which are out of copyright and in the public domain. The LAPL e-media collections are among the most extensive of any U.S. public library. New e-media titles are purchased on a weekly basis for all age groups. We purchase new popular fiction and nonfiction based on patron and staff suggestions as well as bestseller reports. For the most, po for the most part, publishers dictate that ebooks must circulate in the same manner as a traditional print title. That is, only one patron can check out a book at one time. As with print titles, the library purchases as many copies as possible to maintain a ratio of one copy for every five patron requests. The patrons may choose a seven-day, 14-day, or 21-day loan period, and downloaded titles may be returned early. Last year, downloads of our e-media content exceeded 1 million, accounting for about 7% of all library materials checked out by patrons. And um, the uh, library's e-books may be downloaded by anyone with a Los Angeles Public Library card. And, we have two types of cards. We have the traditional card, which most people are familiar with. This full service card is available when you go into a branch and you show your ID and um, you're issued this card. It provides access to not only all of the print materials in the library, but also to our electronic resources online. The second type of card, which we've offered since 2007, is the e-card. The e-card um, is available online. Once you register online, you are sent an email within a few minutes 
with an e-card number, and that e-card number allows you to access most of our electronic resources, our databases, our e-books, our e-audio books. And that has proven very popular with people who are less able to go into their local library. Hmm. How long does it take to download? To actually download a book anywhere from, it depends on the providers, the users, uh, equipment, but two minutes to ten minutes could be a maximum. Mm -hmm. Could be even quicker. The faster your um, your downloadability, the faster the book goes. Audio books are a little bit longer, but not very much. Okay. Well, so what what's what happens next? What is the plan for for expanding this? Yeah. Digital 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 media is very much part of the library's future. And now that Measure L has passed, we're hoping that in the coming years our materials budget will increase. And as it increases, we will be spending uh, uh, a larger share of our materials money on digital content. Yeah. Has there been a, a, an impact on the workforce? Or, <coughs> um, or has there been a growth in people who use the library? Um, since we started the e-card, we've had about 10,000 new people register for library cards. So, so we have more library cards issued. We, we do. More e-cards. People are, are grateful for the opportunity to access the e-books online from home. So that has resulted in 10,000 new users to the library. You said... You said um, E cards, right? But would it, wouldn't they have had a regular library card? Some did, but most did not. Most, for the most part, so you're saying the ten thousand are people who didn't have a library card. For the most part, okay. that's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There wouldn't be any need for both if you had the regular card. You would. No, I understand that, but but the point I'm trying to get to, and I, I worry when people say things like, "For the most part," um, the question is 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 there a growth in the use of the library services? Um, we anticipate growth as we start increasing our hours in the coming years with the Measure L money. We, ha we took a significant reduction in hours in the last couple of years. Well, obviously, but, we but, uh, but this they can access 24 hours a day, right? Right. So, so I, I want to get back to my fundamental question. Is there a growth in the number of people who are using our library system that results directly from the use of the e-card? Correct. Electronic use of our library system, not necessarily visits to the physical buildings, but access to our resor web resources. The, the question is, you're making it very complicated. Okay. It's a very simple question. Is, are there more people who are using our libraries as a result of the e-books? Yes. Okay. Yes. That, and, and where is that analysis? In the number of downloads of our e-content, over one million. No, here. no, because you could have a regular card user who downloads materials. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the sheer number of people who are using the library. So. I'm, I'm looking, where is the analysis for that? Is there a report that demonstrates how that is true? The report, uh, there are various reports. We have door count reports, which show the number of people coming into the library. Mm -hmm. And then we have reports which show the number of people who are not visiting the library, but are downloading our resources from home or from work. Yeah, but again, they may be people who always use the library. They're just use, they're using it from home. That's not what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to figure out who are n the, the increase in the, the number of people who are using the library and where they are. That, then I would go back to the 10,000 figure. But you're not telling me where the 10,000 is coming from. Are you picking it out of thin air? Where, where? No, those are the actual e-card registrations that But again, those, many of those are people who had a regular library card. No, those are... How, no. Where's that analysis? Where's that report? If they already had an... Where do you get 10,000 from? Because 
those are the online registrations. If they had already had no, no, no. this okay. library, wait, 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 we're, we're, you're, you're, we're, we're not communicating. Connected. We're not communicating. So I, I, let me. Right. I'm going to keep asking until I get an understanding for what I'm trying to say if I'm not saying it correctly. I want to know if there is a report that has done an analysis to demonstrate that there's been an increase in, in the use of our libraries. In that has to do with the use of e-books. Uh, I don't know how else to answer your question. We, um, the reports we have, the analysis we have. Is well, but that's my point. It's not here. I don't have it. I'm glad you have it, oh. but I want to see it. That's what I'm saying. Where is it, and what's the name of that report, so I can refer to it? If I were a reporter, I mean, it's very nice that you tell me this stuff, but I want to see it. We can generate a computer report to provide you. Great. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't bring it with me. <laughs> okay. Um, always bring extra, because you never know where we're going to go with this stuff. Um, but again, has there been an effect on our, what, is, what are the impacts on our workforce? Does this mean we, we need fewer uh, city employees or does this mean that we need employees to be used differently to do different things? What we have found is it has not, re it has not resulted in less work for our employees. What it has resulted in is more people coming into our facilities with their e-readers that they've received for Christmas and saying, hey, library. Or whatever holiday. Right. And say, how can you, can you help me know how to use this Kindle that I got? And hmm. what resources do you have that I can download to my Nook? And so it has resulted in okay. librarians taking on a new role as a technology intermediary, helping people learn how to use these devices. Yeah. It w has there been a need for additional training? Yes, and we have a training office that provides, provides that. Right. Okay. Absolutely. It's okay, so um, all of these, these uh, this, this whole area of e-use has, has uh, created opportunities to expand the use of our libraries. And while we, we have reduced the workforce in our library system, we nevertheless are able to expand in terms of the people who are using our library. But it's not because uh, more efficiency or effectiveness, we're just using a different technology. New technology. Which expands it, okay. <clears throat> and th there has been uh, no reduction in, in workforce related to this. Really? We've reduced the department. Right. But have there been any reduction in the workforce that's directly related to this? No. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, I'm very, uh, very fascinated by all of this. And I, I can envision uh, uh, working with the school district to do some very innovative uh, uh, programs, outreach programs, to educate kids on how to, how to connect to this, uh, the library without leaving their house. And, and it, is, it is a serious problem in, in neighborhoods like mine where <clears throat> um, parents are working well into the evenings and they're not home supervising their kids. They don't necessarily send them to the libraries, but, but this is a way for, uh, essentially, for the library to visit their home. Absolutely right. Great. I have two cards on this item. Uh, Roy Stone? I'm going to ask you the exact same questions. You know that. <laughs> He's our IT guy. Hi, my name is Roy Stone. I'm president of Librarians Guild. And this is Henry. I'm the next no. card, so I thought I'd come up too. Is yeah, absolutely. You you must be uh, Henry Gamble. Yeah, executive vice president of Librarians Guild and okay. acting uh, branch manager, Brentwood Branch. Okay. Okay. Well, we just wanted to uh, be on the same understanding of, of what the motion is because uh, mm -hmm. we have... Uh, um, you know, we're, we're pleased that there's uh, access through the e abilities of people, mm -hmm. um, but but there was an aspect of renewing a library card online in here, <coughs> and we're concerned about that because the reason the people have to come into the library is so that we can verify that's you and your address 
and any late notices are going to go to that address from your driver's license, and it has to be a current driver's license. So the person has to come into the library at some point to get the library card or to renew the library card. So mm -hmm. we need to verify that. You know, there's identity theft issues. There's a variety of situations that can go on. So we, we, we uh, take good care of that information. We guard it carefully, as you know. And um, so that's that part we don't want to see changing to any. So um, you said you want to verify the person coming in uh -huh. through through a picture ID. Mm -hmm. Current. To get a library card or to renew a library card, they can apply for a library card online. Everything can be set up for the second that they walk into but if that they, branch. But if they had a, uh, they went to MacArthur Park, got a phony ID, um, how would you know the difference? That we wouldn't accept uh, unless you can, uh, well, I, I, I hear some of those are so good that people, you know, I, I don't know if the police officer can tell the difference. Then, then we're not going to know. Although in some cases there's a, we have uh, two forms of ID are required. So if there was a question or something, we might mm -hmm. say, wait, something doesn't seem right about this. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to eliminate that. We do trust, you know, there's some level of trust here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we're, we're careful. Mm -hmm. and we hope to avoid those situations. Okay, um, and in terms of uh, the the uh, expansion of the people who use the library as a result of this technology and uh, the transition of uh, the what the workforce is doing, um, you concur with the department's statements? Right. For the, for the most part, it's an interesting, uh, af after major holidays, mm -hmm. um, people get those items as gifts. And so there's, there's a period of time people come in, you know, a couple of times a week. And then it tapers off because then they figured out how to use is this it. A, this is a relatively new phenomenon after, yeah. after the holiday. Or it is. Because people, they, they might uh, otherwise get a book right. as a holiday gift. And uh, so they wouldn't come to the library. Well, but if they, they get, if they get a, a Kindle, they go to the library because you guys know how to use it. Right. Well, we, yeah, yes. <laughs> and you can show me. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I so would they, have never they, thought about that. Right. Um, and, and um, you know, we, we do help them over the phone, um, get them started. Yeah. And if they've received that, they usually have some kind of uh, technology background. Okay. Well, my goal mm -hmm. is to get as many people to use the library as, as possible. And one of the reasons I find this subject fascinating is because uh, with reductions in the hours of direct uh, access, uh, we can create indirect access through the web 24 hours a day, and that's a beautiful thing. It, um, it truly still, is, and, yeah. and expanding on that is the fact that we have live homework help that is available not 24 hours, but uh, till late in the evenings. So hmm. the, the family that you mentioned, the, the parents are at work, the student can come go online and get actual live homework help. Yeah. They can download or read database information, so it's real reference sources, uh, not just what they see on yeah. the internet. This is homework help with a real tutor, wherever someplace, you know, qualified tutor to give them help on all the uh, subjects in high school. Wow, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'd, yeah. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, but. Not in this meeting. <laughs> That's right. At some separate time, I'd like to get briefed yeah. on, on the homework projects. I'm just telling my staff right now. Um, the um, What was I going to say? Well, we want to continue to explore. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, with regard to the IDs, um, you can get, can't you get a visual? On a computer? I mean, if they have a camera, they can, like, Skype you or something. What is it about? Oh. What is it about somebody being in front of you that they can't do by just sending a video? I mean, or being on a Skype phone call or something? For library cards? To I to do the ID piece? Oh, um, they they're usually taking something out of their wallet. Mm -hmm. um, you you do get to see that picture. You do get to look. You, you're holding that ID. It's not just in the wallet. We're, we take their ID. Mm -hmm. We look at it. Um, I, again, I haven't purchased one of the ones in uh, MacArthur Park, uh, so I don't know. Well, for full disclosure, I haven't either. <laughs> so, um, 
so so um, yeah. although I remember driving with a former mayor not this mayor but a former mayor uh, by MacArthur Park and everybody was waving at him and I had to advise him uh, mayor please don't wave back <laughs> they they want you to buy an ID right, right. but that was yeah so uh, <laughs> a beautiful thing too it, it's nice to have them actually come into the library because once they come into the library they start looking around mm. and they start meeting people and they start realizing things that they wouldn't have known unless they were actually in that building yeah but, but I recognize that but but frankly um, a lot of people are locked in their homes for a variety of reasons not literally but but socially um, back in the day it was no big deal for a kid to walk to the library and today, it's a serious concern in, in many neighborhoods where our libraries are. Um, and so, so that's one reason, it, you know, you, and then there, there are senior citizens who, who um, uh, stay in their homes, never, never leave. I mean, that's why we have the, the food delivery programs. Um, so I would hate to see them not be able to enjoy uh, life by vir virtue. Uh, a virtual uh, uh, participation through the library system. Well, that e-card would be yeah. available, and yeah. they could do the e-card and, and download all right. of those. If they're but they would still have to come in. I'm just saying. Oh, no, not for the e-card. Yeah. Not for the e-media oh, e okay. use. Okay. Right. So yeah. they, they can do all of that from home. Well, I don't want to get, get too technical. I just wanted to, uh, to get a taste of, of this new uh, technology and, and to see so that when, when the subject does come up, we can uh, continue to expand on it. And, and I'm glad to see that, that you're on yeah. in sync with the department on this because I see it the same way. I think uh, what it does is expand the, the, the participation more than anything else. Right, and, we all uh, want that. Yeah, that would be great. We and and we give, especially given our limited resources. Right? We, we did come here, though, for another major concern about no, whenever no. there's a discussion and inquiries about the e-media the e and increasing it and saying that's, a, you know, telling the library you should increase more digital divide. Yeah. <laughs> for e-media, a kid or someone needs one of three things. Mm -hmm. A computer where they can actually read a book, so ideally at home, a, a Nook or a Kindle. They need one of those three things. If they're just going to buy one of those expensive things just for the library downloads, um, that's a lot of expense just for the library downloads. They still would have to be willing to probably purchase books with their own money. So. E, you know, the, the, the divide between haves and haves nots should always factor into this discussion because if we buy, the library already is on a trajectory to, to purchasing e-media, but if more pressure is put on without that conversation happening, you're talking about taking out of book funds. Anecdotally, last year, I was a young adult librarian. I went to Hamilton High School near Culver City. I talked to over 200 high school students mm -hmm. to promote summer reading. We had two giveaways. At the end. All they had to do is come into the branches, participate in one program, do some reading, and they could win a free nook. And they could win, possibly, an all-expense-paid trip to Disneyland. I can say with 100% certainty there was no interest at all in the nook from any of these students. Mm -hmm. Over 200 students, they had no interest, they had no questions. The Disneyland trip, a lot of interest, a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So it speaks volumes about where we are currently. 19% of, of families or kids live in poverty in the state of California. And 64% of, of families who live in poverty do not have a computer at home. So if we're going to start pouring more money into this e-media, which we know we kind of have to do, I'm here to urge you to do it gingerly and to always factor in that we serve everyone in this big city. Mm -hmm. And uh, books are still very important. They can still walk into any library in this city and bring home a bag full of books every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, let me share with you that uh, when I was in the state senate, I chaired the uh, select Committee on the Digital Divide, and um, I'm very familiar with those statistics. And But I can also share with you that uh, uniquely California, uh, uniquely in California, seniors use the web more than any other state in the union. In fact, it's a majority, um, and it, it, it's by far, it was, it was, it, it was amazing 
the number two state was far behind California in terms of the number of seniors who use it. So on the one hand, I, I, that, that's why I mentioned seniors, because uh, they are using technology. They are using email, and, uh, and I assume they're, they're using these books as well. Um, so that's one population that, that, that uh, is sort of counterintuitive in, ter in, in terms of their behavior in California relative to the rest of the nation. And I don't know why that is. Maybe all of us in California came from someplace else. I don't know. And we're reaching back or, or you know, I don't know. Uh, but for whatever reason, the seniors in California are more, uh, more likely to use uh, the Internet than anybody any other state in the nation, and second, and these are these are ten year, ten year old facts. I mean, so but um, secondly, the the every neighborhood had essentially equal uh, access to computers, um, but not in the home, and so the key the key um, is that uh, for those families that don't have access to computers in the home. They have to go to the library. I, I absolutely uh, understand that. Um, but uh, ultimately, now can you access this by just using a phone? Because more and more, I mean, almost every kid in high school has a phone nowadays. And, and, and more and more of them, I think, are going to have that, uh, that digital divide is, is, is going to shrink by virtue of, of techno ha handheld technology. So. So it's it's something that I think is is it's it's very important. Let me put it this way: as as uh, a Hispanic uh, elected official uh, who comes from Sun Valley, Pacoima, I really appreciate you saying what you just said, uh, and it is something that we have to be mindful of, particularly given the fact that 90 percent of the kids who who uh, participate in in public schools in Los Angeles are minorities. Uh, then we really need to address that concern. Uh, and most of them are economically challenged. And so it's difficult for them to get these high-tech uh, instruments. But I think we've belabored this far beyond uh, the point I wanted to. But uh, I do appreciate your participation. And, I'm, uh, and on the other issue, I wanted if you could uh, maybe just brief me uh, separate from the, this, this formal meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Labange, we yeah, want to. Would you please have five at the library come back? I just have a couple questions. Can we uh, approve the consent uh, yeah, uh, calendar? There's one? items one through four. Let me just look at them because this came from a scene. What you want to do is the library gone? No, right here. A scene? Are you in a movie or? Excuse me. Are you in a movie? No, I just got the committee. Yeah, I had yes. a problem in my district that I want to address, but I saw the library was here. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Newcomer, the well, he's the chairman of the committee. I just right. you went up, they got away, and you said to move to approve. So I wanted to. No, 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 no. Got it. Move okay. to approve the consent items. All right, let me just read them and catch up. I'll follow your lead. Thank you. Did you we're, have we're, a well, is the library here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, all right. I want to talk about the library. On this particular issue right here, and you could just say this right here. E-books. E-books. I know. How many, what's our numbers of books that we both Numbers of hard books or e-books? Well, I have the e-book figure right with me. Okay. It's 40,000 approximately e-book and e-audio book figures. Got it. And then how many, how many is, you don't know regular books? 6.4 million. 6.4 million books go out the door. Well, that's our collection. Good. We, well, no, how many go out the door? 15 million a year. 15 million a year. And do we have them by library? Yes, we do. Good. Okay. Sweet. And you could get that information? Sure can. Okay. Because I'd like that information just to see because it's an encouraging thing that people, it's the busiest city facility, uh, constant, rain or shine, a library. So I'd just like to know that. And on this area here, is this picture for this? No. No? Okay. So on the e-books, well, give me a little quick thing. Coming into my district. Good job. I could have the high rise too up there. That's a good job. I like that. That's fast work, Richard. What is the, uh, what is our point on our, to give me just a synopsis in 25 seconds on the e-books. Okay, the library now has in excess of 40,000 e-book and e-audio titles. Um, we also have tens of thousands of e-books that are in public domain through um, the Project Gutenberg title. Right. Um, new e-media e titles are purchased on a weekly basis. Okay, and in the libraries, which you're a member of a national organization too, as far as library associations, et cetera, which library department is the shining light 
in this area. Collection services. Of? The Los Angeles Public Library. We're, we're, we outstrip everybody else, meaning? Oh, you mean across the country? Yeah, who's? Well, one, we're one of the foremost libraries across the United States in right. um, downloadable materials, yes. Okay, that's important for us to know. And the other thing, too, because someone said New York City libraries now, some of them are opening to 10 and 11 at night. And they're putting coffee houses in them and doing things like that. Is that true? Well, yeah, they're also putting many millions of dollars of donor money into them. And yes, sure. they are doing well. But we're doing well for what we're doing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm real impressed. Last question. Is the exhibit in Central Library still up on the borders and maps of the city? Okay, can we, uh, no. can we stay with email? We, no, no. I want you to. No, I just e want you. That's the last thing, though, Mr. Chair, I just want to say for you and the others in the sound of my voice, if you have time, Go to the Central Library. It's a great historic collection of maps of all the city, and you would enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, on the consent, you're going to catch up on that I'm one. Item number basic. five is completed. Item number six. Mr. Chair, on item number five, are we holding a committee or approving it and sending it forward to council? Uh, we can approve and send to council if Mr. Bonds will Yeah, agree. I second it. That's fine. Park Park Communities. Item number six, motion, Alarcon Wesson relative to the status of the 50 Parks Initiative and increasing park space in areas of Los Angeles that are park poor. Good afternoon, uh, Mike Shaw, I'm joined by Daryl Ford from Department of Recreation and Parks. Again, um, Mike Shaw, joined by Daryl Ford with the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks, uh, reporting on the 50 Parks Initiative. Um, we will be following up with a, a detailed report to the committee. Um, we don't have that ready for you today, but I am prepared to give you a pretty detailed summary if uh, you'd so desire. Okay. So the, the 50 Parks Initiative was a uh, was born out of an, um, I mean, we've always been trying to um, increase our open space. In fact, the department over the last uh, probably six years has increased the park acreage by more than 650 acres um, on nearly uh, 40 new, new parks. Um, with the economic downturn, as it as it's uh, called in many ways, the uh, we looked at this as a huge opportunity to increase it even more as property values dropped, we saw lots of opportunities to, to buy open space, and also to partner with a lot of organizations that may have um, space that they're willing to donate. Um, so through a strategic planning process that we had with our Board of Commissioners, particularly with our Commission President, Mr. Barry Sanders, and through uh, much assistance from, uh, from the Mayor, um, our, our Commission President and our General Manager, John Kirk Muckery and the mayor um, began to discuss different ways of acquiring uh, properties um, at initially at no cost to the department nor the city. Um, that was mainly through foreclosure programs from banks um, where we started, where we started out looking for properties. And as of today, we've secured one site that has been donated from the banks. Um, however, there was other opportunities that, that um, became much more fruitful and as it stands today there's um, we currently have um, 50 parks identified um, to be uh, completely built out probably in the next four years um, we're still in the process of acquiring grant funds on some of them but of those 50 um, we have 36 sites that we've absolutely secured so they are they are city property um, and seven of those uh, seven of the sites are still in process of being acquired um, but in all total, we have 50 sites available, uh, or uh, uh, definitely identified. We have identified nearly $80 million in funding for, this, for the new parks um, in, in that on this list. Um, much of the funding is coming through uh, partnerships that we created with the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust, the uh, Los Angeles Neighborhood Ini Initiative, the Trust for Public Land, the MRCA, um, and also our city partners, DWP, um, and uh, a key partner in all this has been the Los Angeles Housing Department, um, where we've actually got nine uh, properties from them that are residential lots that will be pocket parks. Um, we're still waiting to hear on some grant funding that was associated with the CRA. He was a very big partner with us on this program. Um, but after uh, some of the grants that were awarded to them, we're in a process, um, and some of those matters have already been before City Council, to try to get those grants transferred to Reckon Park so that we could actually see those projects brought to fruition. Um, the, uh, I mean, beyond that, I mean, the whole goal of the program is, just to, is to find and acquire and build new parks in areas that are in close proximity to residents. 
um, where they don't have the ability to either travel or, or get to some of our larger parks in the city. Um, areas that we've uh, concentrated on looking at is areas like Pacoima, South Los Angeles, um, Wilmington, um, I mean, to name a few. But those were, you know, we definitely have targeted areas. What about the Wilshire Center and Koreatown area? Wilshire Center and Koreatown is a very important um, site because of its density um, and the lack of park space there. So that is, that is one of the areas as well. Okay, we, um, uh, we un uh, when is the map going to be ready? Uh, we could probably have it ready um, in a couple of weeks, a full report back to the... Okay, I just I want to I want to have that uh, map in front of us when we sure. talk about this more. But uh, could you, you've, you've talked about the objective to create all these parks, but you haven't said why. What, tell, tell, if you could tell us about why uh, the department and the mayor have, have are, are, are venturing in this direction. What, what do we benefit from having these uh, pocket parks? Or what, I mean, there's some assumptions you, you make right. right off the top, but right. what are the specific what is the specific thinking behind it? Well, the idea the idea of the program is is that I mean we we don't believe I mean there's there's you, you all quite often hear that the park the, the city is park poor. We don't necessarily believe that. We believe that there's areas in the city that are park poor, but we don't put that in the aggregate. I mean, there are definitely areas that don't have uh, of the city that don't have a park within walking distance or a park that they're able to travel to. Um, so uh, let me ask you first of all, what is the definition of park poor? Generally speaking, national the national way of looking at it is anything less than four acres per thousand. Is per thousand people? Four, yes. Four, uh, four acres uh, of parkland per thousand residents. That Standards like that in, don't in generally what, exist. In, in what area? What? Well, what, it does, what, regardless of the area, it's it's four it's it's thousand, it's a basically a, a, a four acres of land within a thousand. Whether the area. Now we occurred. just yesterday, it's based just on last week, uh, was it the there's some study came out that defined Los Angeles as the most dense uh, uh, by population in the nation, seven thousand people per acre, uh, uh, or per square mile. Excuse me. That would be fun, um, <laughs> but uh, seven thousand people per square mile, and that's higher than New York, Chicago, yeah. anywhere else in the nation, uh, which was actually surprising to me. Maybe it's because I'm from the valley, but uh, not surprising but never, to me. It's, uh, that's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so that I have to believe that's part of that the. It's definitely part of. We it. can't. We we can't uh, because the city is is for the most part built out. Uh, we can't be. Necessarily, we try to find opportunities to build out uh, uh, large parcels of land for for large parks. But generally speaking, it's, they're hard to find. So you don't want to exclude uh, some neighborhoods from having uh, opportunities. Uh, <coughs> so we create these smaller parks. That's precisely, and, and the majority of the the parks in this program are what we call pocket parks size. Um, we don't have definitely, I mean, we generally speaking, we say anything less than an acre is, is a pocket park, but re the reality of it is, is a pocket park is much smaller than that. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunities for parks, as you just stated, is very, is very, it's very much challenging, but what we've been able to do is, is um, create a lot of these little pocket parks. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't provide the active recreation that is still missing in a number of communities. Um, we still have a need for more ball fields. We still have a need for more soccer fields. Um, we'll, there are sites in, uh, in our plan, one being in your district, which is the lakeside property, which is a 70-acre DWP site. Mm -hmm. That's an area we'll address a lot of the, you know, active rec for that area. But we, we do need... But even at a, par a pocket park, you could, you could provide exercise equipment. Oh, we, and we certainly are. We've, we've done numerous road shows out to the communities that we're building these in where we actually took uh, prototypes of this equipment out. Handball. Handball. People to try, people yes, handballs, handball, and other one. Yeah. The exercise equipment is very popular mm -hmm. and very much demanded, and and, and okay. there's a lot of the designs on these parks. Park well, also in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, we're the number one area in the state for obesity. Yes. And and and, and, and a, a correlative uh, high rate of uh, diabetes. Right. So. Yeah, in our executive summary important. to. To, that we're preparing. I mean, it's the, the it, it well, just you know. Of course, it helps with obesity issues. It helps with the social issues in neighborhoods. It helps yeah. with property values in neighborhoods. Yeah. And there's a variety of way, reasons why we need to add more parks. Mm -hmm. um, and all that will be addressed. I don't really oh, want to add. Sure. Yeah. And just to talk to the, you were discussing a little bit about park poor, and and Mike was talking a little bit about uh, the city's acreage. One of the important things that studies have overwhelmingly shown 
that when you put a park within a quarter to a half mile of someone, that they'll walk to that park and they'll use that park more. It may not be that they're going to go there to play soccer or baseball, but the actual act of them walking to the park um, provides a lot of that level of fitness that people need. And it's also, you know, sort of a gateway. If they start walking to the neighborhood park, they start walking to the pocket park, then they'll want to engage more after that. And that's really um, what we've been looking at of those gaps. We, like you said before, we won't be able to build large soccer fields in the middle of Koreatown or Westlake. It's not going to happen. But we can build these small pocket parks that people can walk to and uh, sort of get that part of their exercise and engage in that bit of um, recreation in their community. So, Is there a report that delineates all these goals? Yes, it's come. It's forthcoming. We okay. we didn't have it. Time okay. Ready for yeah, because um, I, I, as you were speaking, I was thinking. You know, one of the things that the pocket parts do is eliminate blight, and that's one of the primary goals uh, of these these things. We're so, uh, well, we anxiously uh, await the map. Uh, I was surprised, honestly, to see that my district was designated as one of the one of the areas, or the Northeast Valley, I should say was designated as one of the pocket poor areas in the city because I have a Hanson Dam, Veterans Park, El Carrizo Park. These are regional parks. Um, but there are some neighborhoods that, that have very little park space you know, that are in my district. So um, so I, that's why I was asking about the definition for for uh, uh, for park poor. But, but we'll anticipate the report. Uh, so you'll work with Marissa and my staff to uh, schedule a date. We'll keep this matter in committee. Uh, and, uh, and consider it, you uh, know, perhaps a month or two. But uh, thirty days would be fine. Uh, thirty days would be great. Tom, did you have any questions? Yeah, just a couple things, just in follow up. In 1930, 90 percent of the housing was single-family dwelling in Los Angeles. Uh, as the city grew in post-war, and I think the biggest challenge for the parts of the San Fernando Valley is we built the housing, but there's a lot of uh, tracks that do not have sidewalks and make it difficult for people even to think about walking because uh, they're roll-up curbs, et cetera, et cetera. The school issue is big to me because in a lot of the bond issues that we've had, we have joint use agreements, but I really don't know if you said this is joint use and this is a pin. You know, if I open this up, I could ride on it, and it works. If I say this is joint use, I don't know if it's working as well. Even with the community colleges, uh, which is public funded and with LA Unified. I think we have to visit that and really try to strengthen it because it's the same people's money on this issue here. Being, move, being on the move is very good, uh, and many people do. I think we have to encourage people to be on the move and exercise, whether it's hiking in our regional parks. Uh, the, the, the thing about a small park, it's good unless it's not maintained. And one of the challenges you have is don't have the maintenance behind the development of these. Is that true? Well, we're trying to address it. I mean, certainly everything is a challenge right now at the fiscal crisis that the city remains to be in. But the um, we are trying to address um, a lot of those issues through how uh, di through different means of uh, of maintenance, and we're being much smarter in how we design these parks. Our, our maintenance staff is heavily involved in the design process of them, so that we can work out some of those issues that um, to not put maintenance heavy items in there. Well, we actually right. have, uh, we had an item on our agenda on the consent calendar okay. where it was a pocket park, but uh, prior to the approval of the park, there was already uh, uh, a maintenance uh, uh, feature incorporated into the long-term. In the, de into the, ve the development into project? the grant process, yeah. and, and, Every, and the nonprofit is going to manage it, the maintenance right. of it. And Every new park so, has, yeah, we're yeah. going through that process in every new park. Well, the other thing I did want to mention, too, in our history, too, in the development post-war, many of the apartment buildings had their own recreation. They had their own pools. They had recreation rooms. Uh, some of that has changed now, but a lot of, you know, there's a, there was a development reason why they did that, because it is. And if you go, the poorest section of the city is the highest densely populated. You can go from Lafayette Park and MacArthur Park. You go to uh, Seoul, Ardmore Park. Uh, Chateau Park, Robert Burns is a postage stamp, all the way to Pan Pacific. So you're going from downtown, basically, all the way to Fairfax Avenue before you get a regional park. And that's Pan Pacific, which was a flood control project, which does have multi-activity, uh, which is, and the director there does a wonderful job. But I think we should look at some of these things. And the toughest question we have, Mr. Alicone, I believe in the future, is if we have one pot of money, which is the people's money, Yet do we invest in after-school programs at rec centers, or do we invest at the school during the school year since the children are there at the school? And how do we balance that out? That's a very difficult That's question. That's easy for me, yeah, at the school. 
because okay. the, the primary purpose for after school is homework. Well, I think also uh, recreation, too, in, the on the primary, schoolyard. The primary reason for after school programs is to enable the kids to have an opportunity to finish their homework. My daughter uh, goes to the Beyond the Bell program, mm -hmm. and whether she was in Beyond the Bell or, or the other after school programs, uh, before they can participate in the sports activities, they have to participate okay, in I got finishing that. their homework. I got that, but I'm just saying that there's a, at the recreation centers, how do we do that? Do we heavy staff during holidays? And summer times when school is out of session, because school now has returned to a traditional track. It's not year-round it once was. So I think we should have that discussion and see what partnerships we could make. So I look forward to your map and what we could do on that. Thank you. Good. That was good. Um, we're going to continue this matter. Item number seven. Item seven, Chief Legislative Analyst, City Administrative Officer, and Office of the Mayor joint report relative to the use of unexpended Proposition K bond and bond interest monies for the completion of bond project scope requirements and I'm other okay program with everything purposes. Else on the consent. Oh, uh, Mr. LeBlanc has indicated that he supports the consent uh, calendar, so uh, those four items, one through four, are approved on consent. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Ba back to item seven. Good this afternoon. is where we, we, we love to spend money to do good things. Yes. Good afternoon. Bernice Hollins with the Office of the CAO. For this item, I'm representing the LA for Kids Steering Committee that has oversight over the Proposition K program. As the result of a financial reconciliation of the Prop K bond program, we have identified $7.9 million in available bond funds and interest earnings on those funds that are available for programming. The steering committee is proposing three priorities for use of these funds. As a first priority, we need to reserve $640,000 to complete remaining work under the bond program. Secondly, a $5 million funding commitment is recommended for the Children's Museum Environmental Awareness Center project located at Hanson Dam in your district. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the remaining $2.3 million would be set aside to address project funding shortfalls under the Prop K program through future reports to the council. The steering committee finds it is both timely and appropriate to utilize the majority of the available funds to complete the Children's Museum facility. Under phase one of the project, $15.8 million in public funds were expended to construct a two-story, 5,800 square foot facility. However, in order to open the facility, we need $21 million in additional capital to fund the exhibit program and various building modifications. The project currently qualifies to receive $9.2 million in new market tax credit. However, to qualify for these funds, the city must commit upfront the balance of $11.8 million that's needed to, commit th to finish the project. The steering committee is proposing that the city's contribution um, be satisfied through the $5 million recommended through this report, $4.7 million in MICLA financing that's recommended through a separate report, the third construction projects report that's out in pending scheduling and budget and finance, and also $2.1 million that's remaining um, just in unspent funds that are already committed to the project and weren't spent under the phase one development. Um, the steering committee is, of course, very cognizant of the financial challenges that the city is facing um, currently. However, um, it is critical um, that we complete this project in order to safeguard the city against additional financial liabilities. The city has recently partnered with the Discovery Science Center to develop the exhibit program and to operate the facility. Through this partnership, we are currently um, working to open the facility by March 2015. If we fail to meet that deadline, the city would be obligated to repay $7.5 million in state grant funds that were spent on phase one of the project. Um, ultimately, the city would be at risk of having to repay the full $15.8 million in public funds that we've expended if we don't operate, open this facility and operate it for a minimum of 30 years. Um, attending today's committee, I have um, all of our partner departments um, in attendance, the CLA, the mayor's office, and we're available to address any questions that you have um, either on the report or in terms of our project delivery plan for the Children's Museum. Um, the executive management team of the Discovery Science Center is also present today to provide an overview of their current operations and their vision for completing and operating the Children's Museum facility. Joe, why don't you come forward? Is that one's coming, right? Joe, please, uh, uh, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate uh, you, the time that you have uh, dedicated to uh, uh, 
trying to bring this project to reality. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Okay, my name is Joe Adams, and I'm the president of the Discovery Science Center. Uh, Joe, could you tell us, uh, in, in a nutshell, what uh, what we are trying to accomplish with regard to the the partnership that was described? Yeah, the, the Science Center, and before I start, I'd also like to introduce the person to my left. This is Mike McGee, and he's the Vice President of Finance for the Science Center. Uh, and Mike and I are very excited to be here. Um, our goal is to, uh, to have a, uh, a Science Center up there in Hanson Dam, and it's going to be an exciting uh, entity. And we've got a little slide presentation to take you through a little, uh, an element to explain to the committee uh, who we are uh, in more in depth and then a little bit of our vision, if we could take a couple minutes down that path. Okay, so this is us, just to stand on this picture. We're the Cube. We're in Santa Ana. Uh, we see uh, close to a half million visitors a year, and you recognize us by the Cube in that building. That building is actually the same square footage as the building at Hanson Dam, so okay. it's very similar in size. Great. We are a 501c3 nonprofit um, based up. Uh, my board is uh, 40 members from the community at large. We're, uh, we've been at the Science Center in Santa Ana for 13 years. And in existence, we've been around for 25 years, though, as an entity. Uh, we have uh, now grown the Science Center to be a top 25 science center in the country. I've been with the Science Center for nine years as a president, and before that, I came from Disney. Mike also came from Disney. Uh, I think your last role at the Disney was the CFO of the Ducks before they uh, sold it off. So uh, you've got two kind of theme park attraction guys that have kind of come in and taken over the role of, the, of managing the Science Center and blending seem, our knowledge. I seem to re re remember a Ducks exhibit at the <laughs> Science Center. Is that There is. The, the Ducks are a partner with us. Uh, Mike's had a little part of all that, okay. definitely. <laughs> We, uh, so the Science Center, um, so I've been around for nine years, and we've grown it. And uh, it's, it's uh, now uh, not only a top 25 science center, we're also ranked third in, uh, among science centers in the community of what our teachers go into the classrooms in Los Angeles, Orange County, and the Inland Empire in uh, programming where we see over 220,000 kids. So our entity is both... Uh, the site uh, and everybody coming to the site as a museum, a hands-on interactive museum, and then what we do out into the community. So it's kind of a two-fold program, which we definitely envision would happen up uh, in Los Angeles as well. Um, as far as the attendance at our science center, we see over 75,000 students coming on annual field trips. We are in after-school programs. It was interesting hearing the after-school uh, conversation just before we got up here. Um, we're in every after school program in the Santa Ana Unified. So every elementary school in the Santa Ana Unified, we're there once a week teaching science education uh, and, and uh, all aimed at the California science standards. And then on top of that, we are a professional development program where we go out and help teach uh, teachers, 600 teachers a year, in uh, how to teach science. Science is kind of a complex uh, subject, so we're out there. Turn. Indeed. Um, some of our recognition, uh, we've been voted the, uh, recently the 11th best science center in the country uh, under the uh, Children's Museum uh, area for the Parents Magazine. Uh, this year, Bank of America uh, gave us the honor of the uh, Neighborhood Excellence Award. We've gotten several recognitions from Best of LA and uh, KTLA and the others, Orange County Register. Uh, this year, we're also a uh, finalist in IAPA, which is the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions for Marketing and Operations. And then uh, Orange County Business Journal has named us one of the largest nonprofits in Orange County. Our strategy at the Science Center is, uh, is blending a lot of things together with rotating exhibits and state-of-the-art exhibits. And so when we mean a blend, that's making the exhibits immersive, interactive, inspiring, engaging, and entertaining. So it's, it's a folding of kind of the old style of science centers to the new style, which is making them immersive, entertaining, all of these elements. Education is at the elements of, of what we're doing, but it's got to be hands-on, physical, and exciting. So it's, this is not a museum and things behind a case that you look at. you got to play, climb, move. This is, this is a, a lot of that. And then measurements are very important to us. Um, this shows just uh, over the last uh, five years that uh, we've got history on uh, you know, being, bringing in revenues and uh, having a cash surplus at the end of each year. Uh, every year since I was here, for so nine years at the Science Center, we've had uh, surpluses and grown the Science Center. Actually tripled both attendance and tripled our revenue streams at, of the Science Center uh, over the last five, nine years. When we started, though, it wasn't that way. It was tough to get something like this off the ground and going. 
So now we've grown it to have a board of directors. These are just some of the uh, 40 board members of the Science Center. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, are connected to large companies, so there may be uh, CEOs or vice presidents of these companies, and a lot have a, a foothold both in Los Angeles and in Orange County. Are you in private or public land where you sit? We own the land. You own the land? Yep. And were you originally, that was what you originally built for? No. Uh, well, it was a Barker Brothers furniture store before us and a skate The Cube. Ranch. The Cube. The cube was for us. It was a, a strategy to uh, be an icon. You got it. Uh, my team is made up of our senior management it has 55 years of combined experience from Disneyland. So I pull from the Disneyland. It's only five minutes down from us. Uh, Disneyland knows how to train people into guest experience. And so I love to, and I don't have to train my, my executive team on what I'm looking for for a guest experience. They come with that. So I've pulled out my, my vice president of operations, uh, several directors of the science center all came from the Disney experience. And then our marketing uh, came from Knott's Berry Farms. So we, we come with that kind of angle. Uh, but our staff is made of uh, local Santa Ana residents. Uh, and volunteers from the whole area, but uh, we're a very big training ground for those first year uh, students that are like high school, college, looking for that first job. This is, uh, they get it uh, from Santa Ana coming to us. In fact, I just had a job fair. 50 people we employed for our uh, bubble fest that was a three week long element. This is a temporary jobs, but we still are able to produce jobs just like that. Um, Los Angeles, we have, uh, on February, we created the Discovery Science Center Los Angeles. Um, it's a 501c3, so we've actually gone through the process. My board has approved uh, us to create this, and we've done the articles of incorporation for uh, the sites. Our strategy is going to be very similar to our success down in Orange County. So uh, state-of-the-art exhibits, rotating exhibits as well. Uh, we'll have uh, two different revenue streams, partly uh, earned revenues, and the other side coming from contributed revenues. So it's, uh, both, both are going to be part of the equation. Timeline for the project um, it kind of goes all the way out to a March uh, 2015, but uh, we're off right now. Uh, developed a lot of the exhibit concept ideas. Uh, draft plan is due here this summer, and then uh, final plan approved by both the city and uh, the, you know, the Science Center board uh, coming in late 2012, and then we'll be off to the races to fabricate the exhibits, of which we use mostly Los Angeles-based exhibit fabrication companies. Uh, job creation, uh, you know, there's, with, the, with the money that's going to go into this project and the fact that we use Los Angeles space uh, projects, uh, companies, you know, we anticipate over 150 full and part-time jobs associated with the project uh, alone. Now this is, the, the, this, this is an exhibit layout. There's two floors to the museum, and so we've got different zones. I know it's a little hard to see throughout, but if you'll advance it to the next slide, Mike, we'll kind of go through this. Um, so in the slides, we've got in areas that are focusing on the environment, protecting our earth, water, uh, the land and the air, and of course fire is a big deal out there, and the, especially that neck of the woods. The fires recently seem to keep coming out there, so how to connect to the community to prevent that. Making the grade is an area that's going to be focused on the California science standards, hands-on exhibits, explaining uh, what the kids in the classroom are, to, uh, are supposed to be learning and help the teachers uh, give them some resources and tools associated to that to that area. The Children's Health and Literacy Galleries are going to be uh, aimed uh, at both those areas as well. Uh, children's Health, uh, we'll talk, we're going to tackle elements like um, hygiene, uh, oral health. Obesity is an issue. It's an issue in Santa Ana. It's an issue in Los Angeles. And so we, we see uh, exhibits handling those, uh, those issues, a 4D theater as well. And then the other part is this traveling, the rotating exhibits. We'll have four galleries, the main traveling exhibit gallery, the children's health gallery, and the children's literacy gallery. The way to continue to make uh, the, the museums refreshed and keep bringing people in is you've got to have something new there and exciting for people to keep coming. So that's definitely part of the plan. These uh, next elements are just pictures of... Uh, pictures all here. Yeah, you've seen that. So this right. is pictures of the Science Center and then our envision of having the Eco Challenge... Uh, there. So this is Earth. Here's on water, bringing water in. We import most of our water uh, here in Los Angeles, so we want to talk about that. We want to talk about the aquifer that we sit on, uh, the sanitation, what happens in the whole storm drain sanitation systems uh, as well. 
And then the fire and uh, air exhibit areas that we want to talk about, air pollution, we want to talk about fire prevention, uh, and what the public can be doing, and new technologies in those areas. And the Making the Great Galleries, here's some uh, you know, visions of the Making the Great Gallery. Every month, we envision that ga gallery to change. So on one month, we'll be focusing on fourth grade. The next month, we'll be focusing on fifth grade. So there'll be dedicated programs. Everything they're supposed to be learning, we're going to have hands-on exhibits to uh, cover. Uh, here's some visions of the uh, Children's Health and Literacy Galleries as well. And then uh, rotating exhibits. The Science Center uh, World has a series of exhibits that you rent and you can bring in for like three months. There's a whole list of them. We've done it for years. I like Bob the Builder. It. Bob the Builder is good. <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of a viewpoint of uh, what we want to do in there. Good, that's great. I like the other Bob. That's all right. That's okay. SpongeBob. SpongeBob. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, let me uh, let me sort of uh, explain that uh, uh, several years ago, when when we lost the Children's Museum nonprofit, uh, it, it pr uh, produced a tremendous challenge for the city. Uh, to operate a facility that we had dumped a lot of money into and were on the hook for uh, money uh, yet again. And so uh, I, I reached out to the Discovery Science Center because uh, I was fascinated by it. And, and when I had an opportunity to sit down with, uh, uh, with you, I, I took my daughter. And, you know, so we can talk about the statistics, we can talk about the... Uh, um, uh, the analysis and uh, and everything, but I just want to tell you that uh, what sold me was uh, my two-year-old daughter uh, who who got lost when we were having our meeting. Uh, she's kind of precocious sometimes, and and she disappeared. And what was fascinating was that that we found her in the area where the two-year-old kids should be. So she just meandered to the place where she felt comfortable. And it was just amazing that she was playing with the exhibits. And uh, uh, I think that speaks volumes. Uh, some of the exhibits are just phenomenal in terms of, of uh, you know, the, the globe, for example, is just one of the most uh, amazing pieces of, of technology that you have in the center. And it's, you, you can't really describe it. You have to see it. Uh, but that globe is, is real time, and it shows... Um, it can show everything from every earthquake that's happening on Earth right now to uh, every plane that's in the air to uh, it's just a fascinating exhibit. And so, um, uh, you know, I I'll be very honest with you, uh, both the to the department and to uh, to the the Discovery Science Center. Um, sometimes politicians will. You know, harp about a grand grand scheme idea, um, but never really believe they can make it happen. Um, and so, uh, I want to thank all of you for for making this a reality. Now, it's not even a question of whether or not it can happen; it's a question of doing the hard work because we know it can happen. It's just a uh, 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 it's just a process of getting there. <clears throat> uh, so we still have some things to do. We still have some money to raise. We s still have to uh, take advantage of many opportunities and, and focus a lot of attention on it. Um, but honestly, I, I you know, I, and I've done this before, and sometimes it works. It's like throwing spaghetti on the wall. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, but this is one that, that I have to tell you. You know, I, I said if it's good enough for Irvine, if it's good enough for Orange County, it's good enough for Pacoima. And I really believe we can make this happen. Um, so uh, I, I really want to say thank you to all of you for doing the hard work and uh, really believing in this. Uh, and, uh, you know, the talent. The other thing I have to say is what, what in addition to my daughter uh, having a blast there, um, the other thing that is most noticeable, as you can tell by the presentation, the professionalism of the team is just amazing. The talent that they bring together. Uh, coming out of some of the top amusement uh, uh, companies in the nation, just just an amazing team. And if anybody if anybody's going to solve the problem that we had at uh, uh, the former Children's Museum, uh, it, it would have to be an amazing team. And and so uh, that's a compliment to both the city team uh, of and it was a diverse team. It wasn't just uh, recreation and parks, but uh, every department, we had a team that was meeting on a regular basis uh, to get through this very quietly, 
no newspapers involved. We were just doing the due diligence, and uh, and it and it's emerged as a very special project. So um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work for you. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get Tom Labonge's vote on this matter uh, right now. But uh, um, but I, I think this is going to be a tremendous opportunity, not only for the local residents. Um, but for the city of Los Angeles as a whole and the region, uh, in fact, Santa Clarita will benefit probably more than uh, than uh, some of the folks in downtown L.A. Um, uh, I also want to just say one thing about the the genesis of this project. Actually, it came out of the Lopez Canyon landfill. Uh, we shut the landfill, as you know. We created a community amenities fund, one of the first million dollars uh, went into an investment at the Lakeview Terrace Library. Uh, and a second investment went into purchasing the land uh, where this hamburger stand called Baby Beef, where they actually had hitching posts uh, because it's an equestrian community, was was uh, right there. We purchased the property with Lopez Canyon money. Uh, it eventually uh, has uh, developed into what is now uh, the building that was the Children's Museum and will hopefully be uh, the uh, Discovery Science Center at Los Angeles. Um, so the environmental aspects, because it was tied to the closure of a landfill, uh, so that people understand not just that it's a hole in the ground, but that that hole in the ground provided opportunities for development by virtue of uh, extrapolating the the aggregate, and and then and then a place where we we put our waste, and then had the responsibility to manage that 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 waste uh, uh, pile uh, effectively and causing us tens of millions of dollars in in, in cost. To manage our waste system, that was uh, that was an important element, and why we purchased the property and wanted to build uh, at that time an environmental awareness center. So the sanitation piece is important. I think it's important for for many generations to come that in a dynamic waste uh, world uh, that we we have to know how to manage our waste as one of the fundamental uh, key missions in, as you heard me say, the densest city in the nation. Uh, and so for all those reasons, uh, this is a phenomenal opportunity for Los Angeles. I, I only wish I could be around, uh, but in a term-limited world, you know, I, I won't be able to, to be a council member when this happens. Um, but I will definitely be there at opening day because this is a very, very special project. So I want to commend all of you. Thank you all so much for your work, especially the city team. Uh, I know the mayor has has uh, uh, really stepped up on this one and and, uh, and uh, made it clear to the department heads that he wanted he wanted this to make the, this to happen. We really didn't have a, cho a choice. We have a gun to our head with regard to the costs that are incurred if we don't make this happen. And just the sheer embarrassment of having a big hollow structure out there that uh, does nothing. So with that, uh, thank you and. and uh, uh, Tom indicated his support for yeah, this. Yeah, but let me just ask a quick couple questions, sure. uh, Mr. Alicone. We own the building, Recreation and Parks? We, we inherited okay. the building by virtue of the fact that, that uh -huh. the nonprofit that owned it went under. Got it. So we, we, own, it. we now own it. And their home. commission has assigned it to the Discovery Center? Just so we know that. I, I'm absolutely uh, very impressed. And the location couldn't be a better one in our city. Michael, I just want to know the background. So, uh, Good question. Yeah. Uh, Michael Shaw, Rec Recreation Parks. Well, we haven't directly assigned it. We've got a memorandum of understanding in place with our board of commissioners and children. Did you have to do an RFP or anything, or are we just? No, we we are not. Um, we did. It's taken some time. We have solicited a number, but we did not put out a formal RFP. Got it. But this is the one. I, what I what I can't think of a let better me, location. Let me, let me explain. No, you got my vote. You no, don't no, need no, to explain I, it anymore because I, I know the clock's running. Uh, just want to explain one point. The the many of the grants that that w came together require that it be a children's museum. If it is not uh, something uh, that could be defined as a children's museum, then we would have to pay back something like twenty million. I got all that. That's I fine. just think there's not a better location with the environment of Southern California, with the big Tahunga, little Tahunga, uh, with what Richard just spoke of. And you think of the hundreds of thousands of dollars, Madam CAO, or millions of dollars our department spent on educating the public. That you could educate them right here, young kids from all the schools, et cetera. So it's truly to And this is the first question I want you to get when you open up. I believe Long Beach is called Long Beach because of the Big Tahunga and all the sediments from the San Gabriels come through Big Tahunga, come through the Tahunga Wash to the Los Angeles River. Los Angeles River dumps into what is Long Beach. 
and creates a long beach from the sediments. I need to know when you first get your first assignment to study if I'm right in my assertion. That's why they call it Long Beach. <laughs> okay, we'll okay? check it out. <laughs> check that out. Welcome to Tom's world. <laughs> We're on it, Tom. Uh, you know, I, I want to just second what you said. Your team here at the city has been great to work with. We've worked with many city employees uh, down in Orange County. And uh, you'd think that all Orange County has their act together and everything, but I'll tell you what, Santa, it says right here, Los Angeles has blown away you know, a lot of those cities down there. So, uh, so far. So far, we appreciate where you guys have been. <laughs> we don't want to mess it up, but I, but I, have to, I, I want to give due credit to uh, the mayor who has been absolutely uh, uh, supportive of this endeavor. Uh, we, we sort of felt, honestly, uh, all of us felt uh, undermined by uh, what happened at the uh, at the uh, children's museum um, frankly defrauded by by an investor who had stolen the money and was using uh, illegal gotten gains to to uh, make a contribution of ten million dollars which never happened and, and and so the people of Los Angeles were were really um, uh, stabbed in the back on this project so we, we, we really had to make something good uh, so as they say uh, um, uh, rising out of the, the ashes. Um, this is a phoenix, and and uh, and hopefully we will we will be able to to give it back to the people as was originally promised. So, in fact, I think it's going to be better than anything that has been thought of uh, to this date on this site. Well, we're so. going to make you two of you guys proud for sure. Thank Great. Much. Thank you very much, Joe. Make all the children of Los Angeles proud. That's all. Okay, with all that, right, this matter is approved. And uh, do we have any more matters before us? I have no more public uh, uh, no, uh, cards no. and uh, no other public comments. Okay, then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.